says industry is an industry we can't do without. It needs to become fully circular and carbon neutral. This brings challenges and opportunities which we can only face together. The Institute for Sustainable Process Technology is an active and open innovation organization. We use our passion and vision for technology to create a circular industry. Our programs bring people from different sectors and disciplines together, creating overarching themes such as sustainable energy, food, and circular materials. We offer an inspirational and trusted environment for everyone working on breakthrough technological innovations and the future of the process industry. ISPT has a broad and high quality network with over 120 parties in which they share experience and knowledge with like-minded people. It's our ambition to have transitioned to a circular and carbon neutral process industry by 2050 together. Do you want to be part of our network? Go to ispt.eu. All right. Did it work? Yes. Yes. Great summary, TF. Do you want to add anything to this? I'm, I'm very glad about that. Yeah, the, I, 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 I hope I gave a little bit of an overview of what, of what we do. And we are a trust based network, as is being said by the, by the, by the movie. Uh, which has been erected. Uh, I have to stop it now. Sorry. <laughs> that's, the, that's the bad thing about 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 having things on on YouTube. It yeah. it repeats. It starts with the next uh, the next movie. So, uh, but we at Trust Base Network we we've been erected about 30 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, as an in initiative from, from different uh, larger companies who wanted to do more on process technology uh, and, 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 uh, and combine forces in that area. Uh, that's where we started out and at this moment in the movie there was still 120 participants in, uh, in our network. But it's already above 180 I think. So there's a lot of companies uh, joining us uh, and in, indeed the areas where we're working in is in the energy transition and in the, in, the, in the food and the food transition and in the area of the of the circular economy and that uh, and we, we've, uh, ha having said that it's 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 much more words needed uh, to, to identify how many technolo technological uh, uh, areas we're working on but uh, i think uh, um, yeah, you can find it on our website but in, in principle, it's a, it's a cooperation of companies uh, where companies share their know-how, share their best people, share their, share their peers, and that's the way, the, the, the way we, we generate a network, a network of, uh, of intelligent people who know what, uh, what the next step can be and, uh, and define them together which steps they want to take. Uh, of course, we, we're working in projects, uh, and the total project portfolio at this moment is uh, about 120 million uh, euros in, uh, in in total, so it's 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 quite impressive. And that uh, the, the main reason for that is that due to the energy transition and due to the 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 the, 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 the stress on carbon and, uh, and the transition in the in the food industry, a lot of companies are are, are willing to uh, well, yeah, uh, to. to uh, to 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 uh, to attack the challenge uh, together rather than do it alone, and that's that's also the reason why there's there's a lot of a lot of commonality in the uh, in the in the project we do, and we have a lot of a lot of a lot of companies. So that's uh, that's more or less what we what we do. Uh, everybody can uh, can uh, can join in. It's an open innovation network, and uh, I hope uh, this meeting also will uh, will uh, uh, end up in a, in a good cooperation in this uh, very very. Uh, important field of the of the waste product. Yep. Thank you, uh, Thiers. Well, I think it's well summarized. ISPT is an open network organization, so it's not a research institute, but it it initiates and it coordinates projects on behalf of the industry and the research institutes that um, focus on uh, sustainable process industries. So I will then also share the presentation again because this is also why we are organizing it today. And um, well, I will talk about the side stream characteristics and I've included a lot of logo on this screen because these are all the companies that um, informed us about their um, side stream challenges. 
And why do we organize? Because we have faced from stakeholders in the network of ISPT challenges from three perspectives. So on the one hand, there are still a lot of residual streams that are not or not sufficiently utilized. And there are many reasons because they have high variation in the compositions, they, they have contaminants that, that prevent them from proper valorization, they may have a really high water content or just small amounts or they have a variable availability. So they may be only available in April or in December or whatever. So, but it's still, it is, there is a lot and it's, it's crucial that we also, well, uh, facing the circular economy, find a way to utilize them. On the other hand, um, well, there are many stakeholders that have developed technologies or have technologies under development for conversion of these kind of site streams. And um, as, as they're, they're complex residual streams, they might qu quite often are not going into the really high added value ones, but at least into energy carriers or smaller building blocks that can be used for, for chemicals or fuels again. But the question here is also, and especially for the companies that have those residual streams, which of these technologies fits best with the characteristics of my residual streams? Uh, and we, we have nine technology suppliers today, but there are many more um, out there. But and it's also yeah, good that you know that it's impossible for companies quite often to choose between those technologies. And that's why we also have this meeting today. And on the other hand, there are stakeholders that um, are searching for new renewable feedstock for chemicals and fuels. So there is an increasing demand, but how does this demand match with the feedstock and the conversion technology? So can th these te technologies and those streams be uh, a good starting point for um, filling the demand of, uh, of these uh, industries. So what we have done is that we have, um, well, uh, did an inquiry among the industry and also got a lot of input from you when subscribing for this event. And we have um, put them into 22 um, waste streams. And these waste streams have been communicated with the technology suppliers who will be pitching today. And we have asked them to grade each of these streams to their technology, whether it's suitable, very suitable, or maybe tolerable, or absolutely not suitable. Well, I will go into detail with um, just a few categories because we have tried to categorize them in six categories to give a description. Um, but as I am not an expert in each of them, please be aware that I well, I have noted the names of the, sus the subscriptions of today, so I may ask either of you to give a little bit more details on um, on these categories. And um, here I would like to um, to start with the first category, and I call them watery biomass, high in fertilizing minerals and metals. And these are, for example, aerobic biomass which are the secondary sludges of water treatment plants of, for example, the agro-food industry. It may also be primary sludge um, of the agro-food industry. And we have manure and we may have also digestate with high metal content. And here I would like to ask Erik van Hellemond from COSEN, can you give a little bit more details? Yeah, good afternoon, Erik Valmond, uh, Innovation Manager at uh, COSEN. Um, I think um, from a COSEN perspective, we have indeed um, um, on a digest state, uh, specifically uh, a stream which is uh, left over from the, the biomass digestion plants uh, operated uh, by COSEN. These are the, the biomass plants uh, where we digest residual biomass from, from sugar beet uh, only. Um, and what is left over is a residual stream, which we, we call the digestate. And these are um, yeah, rich in minerals, but also specifically in certain um, uh, metal uh, uh, components, which can then be 
uh, yeah, uh, a drawback for, for application. Um, so it's going to be used as a soil, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we return it to uh, for, for soil applications. We'll be also looking at uh, other applications for uh, for digestate uh, to higher parallelization as we do it right now. Yes, thank you, Eric. And then um, Björn van den Oudenhoven, are you in? Yes, I am. Yes, okay, because you also indicated a few um, well streams that may fall under these categories. Could you explain? Um, yeah, you actually, are from yeah. Western. Yeah, right. actually, I, I think there's a, a small misunderstanding in that case. So I, I don't recognize any of uh, this uh, oh, in, that's uh, good. in our process. Then you process, may give so. an, an addition. Yeah, basically what we are looking for is um, um, we have a lots of process water with, uh, with low uh, amounts of solids, um, starch, gelatinized, non-gelatinized uh, minerals. And uh, yeah, we are searching for ways to uh, recover those and um, yeah, actually um, yeah, reduce our waste or uh, our water uh, usage. Yeah. Yeah. We, we yep. also have um, uh, a category on the, on the real water. Can people go on mute when they are Fast not speaking? Available. Yeah, thanks. Then we come back to that one. Björn, thank you for this. Then I would like to go to the category biomass which may be in small amounts, but also highly variable. And here I would like to have some uh, exp further explanation from Alex van Kuilenburg from Milgro. Yes, good afternoon everybody. I'm ecosystem manager of Milgro and Milgro is responsible for sustainable waste and resource management for our clients and with some of them have vegetables and fruits, residual streams. Like part of them, like pulp, uh, are for processing to juices, but also the whole food and vegetables uh, in a chain from growers to retail. And of course, there are like seasonality. Uh, the, the, sometimes you have a lot of mangoes or avocados in one time of period of paprikas or tomatoes. And some of the streams are year round. Uh, some streams are packed, different packaging material. And an example, like if you want to fertilize them to insects, some of them has insecticide on them. Not problem, not, not a problem for different types of fertilizations, but really hard to get them to the insect farms. And another stream is like fish, uh, the, the, the fish processing companies uh, in the Netherlands, they have a lot of skin and other materials uh, left over from the fillets, from the, the, the fillets of the fish. Uh, so they have a lot of leftover materials and that is now going to fish oil and fish meal. But I know there are some types of proteins in it and maybe some more. So we are looking for a better valorization and an alternative on that. Thank you, Alex, for this further explanation. I would like to go to the third category that is containing mixed plastic. So this may be either biomass plus plastics, but it may also be biomass, plastic and metals, some microplastics, for example, uh, recovered from water and it may also be mixed plastics. So um, I would like to ask Rob Philipson from VEPA. Are you already in to give further explanation? Uh, I'm in. Yes. Hi. Um, we don't see you, but that's no problem. Oh, I turned on. Oh, okay. Now you can see me, I think. Yes, yeah. you can see me. Uh, as a paper mill, we have a several reacts uh, stream, like the the plastics that are in our uh, recycled paper. Uh, we filter them out of the process, and that piles up. Um, we are searching for a um, yeah, for a technique to process those plastics into more valuable uh, uh, materials because most of it most of it is burned right now, and we have one special re extreme that's a mixture of polyethylene and aluminium, which is almost free of biomass, 
only a small percentage of fibers are left. And we are searching for a, a solution for that waste stream as well. Thank, thank you, uh, Rob. I, I also saw that, well, at least Kim Anderson from Tetra Pak did subscribe, but I don't know whether she is in. Well, maybe she can react. Yeah. Kim Anderson? No, not in a meeting yet. Then, then I go to the next category. And this may be a bit more, well, a, 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 another kind of um, uh, stream, quite heavy density waste stream with, well, most often no energy value. Um, Walter Mensink, are you in the meeting? Or not yet? I'm in. Yes, Walter, can you explain? Yeah, so. Um, we also from a paper mill, huh? uh, we're using recycled fiber only um, and the heaviest grid is uh, thick stock cleaning. So there we sort out, uh, we keep almost all uh, different types of rejects separate. Um, yeah, the picture shown is not, no. as it is in our case, but we have a lot of glass and, and stones um, available in this. Uh, it's also a small piece of coating, um, rigid plastics. Um, yeah, of, I did an analysis in the past, so there's roughly 20% of steel in it. So, you, uh, but currently this the stream for us is too small to install a separate line to take the steel out and to take the metals out um, to get money for it. But yeah, so that's uh, that's the heavy grid. Um, and then the heavy shoot, yeah, that's just from the pulper. Uh, there's a, a DN450 pipeline with two chutes uh, with valves and, and all the bigger pieces of, of metal, uh, piece of concrete. Sometimes it even blocks this pipe. Um, so it, it's truly big material. Uh, currently, uh, we cannot dispose of it as, uh, as metals anymore. It's too, too much contaminated. Um, yeah, but if there's some way of, of a sorting line where we can pass this material to, it will be nice to find a way, to find a better way. Thank you, Walter, for this for the explanation. Then we go to the fifth category, which is watery mixtures of organic compounds. Um, Kees Bieshevel, can you introduce yourself and explain? Yes, um, thanks for, for the opportunity. Uh, I work at Dow in Tenosen and uh, uh, we process a lot of hydrocarbons. Uh, however, uh, the biggest stream we take in is water and uh, we try to keep them apart, but sometimes they mix and uh, then we have a mixture of uh, typically complex hydrocarbon uh, molecules in a watery environment. Um, we do treat some of that, uh, if possible, in a biological water treatment plant. But there are streams with higher concentrations that are not suitable for that technology. So we are forced presently uh, to incinerate those. Well, obviously, that is not a very uh, suitable technology uh, if you consider that it contains a lot of water. Uh, and within the, uh, we've got a program, an, ever, an everlasting program, it's called REP. It's Waste Reduction Always Pays. So under that umbrella, uh, we are also always looking for, for new solutions for the waste streams. We haven't got a better solution for it just of yet. Thank you, Kees. Um, I would also like to invite Jauke Borsma. Yes, that's me. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. I'm Jauke Borsma from Aqua Minerals. Um, as uh, Aqua Minerals, uh, yeah, we uh, we look for the residuals from both drinking water companies and the water authorities for uh, yeah, for a second life. And the one uh, we mentioned here is uh, is the fats or, or grease. What we see at, at quite some um, water authorities, the, the the fats are removed and not brought into the digesters. Yeah, mostly for the simple reason that it gives some operational uh, issues and sometimes also the digesters are already full. Um, and the fats that are removed have a high, high water content. So initially we, we're looking for, uh, for technologies, but we, in an easy way we can, we can remove the water on site, uh, which would help us um, very well and, and save us at, at the transport uh, cost. 
And secondly, in case we were able to do that, then uh, we might um, upgrade the, the fats and, and maybe bring it somewhere uh, else instead of bringing it into a digestive. Where example, do these trees come from, Jauka? Because that was my... <laughs> yeah, this, this comes from uh, uh, from the households most of the time. It's just cooking oil. And they throw it through the... Yeah, and when you see after New Year, suddenly uh, the amounts uh, uh, <laughs> in increase. Our olibola. Yeah, yeah, from the olibola, correct. Uh, so, but but all the year around, uh, you see it. Some areas you see it a little bit more than in, than in other areas. But in general, it's uh, yeah, it, it's not something. Uh, of course, it's it, it's a nice fuel, especially for digesters. But it gives some uh, some issues. So, what I said, not everywhere they are bringing it into the into their own system. They remove it and yeah, they bring it somewhere, and uh, you, you pay a lot of money for transporting water. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is uh, for, for me really a new uh, side stream that I was not aware of, but uh, thank you for bringing it in. And then I would like to go to the last category is there are, well, side streams with a high percentage of inorganics. First, I would like to ask Rick Kengler or Nico de Groot, you can fight among each other, who would like to explain? And either of them, are you ready? Nico de Groot, are you in the meeting? Or Rick Gengler? I'm just searching. I don't see them yet. Well, that's a pity because they, they were from Coton. And they brought in at least the ones of on terre soil, lime, and um, also this uh, uh, beta cull. Um, yeah, maybe maybe Anita can, uh, can add yes. some in, uh, on ah, behalf of the uh, big company. Well. Yeah. I think these are streams indeed which come uh, at the sugar beet uh, processing, um, especially the uh, beta cull is one important side stream of the sugar processing. Uh, it's rich in uh, calcium oxide, but also so in different minerals and uh, as you can imagine it's a large uh, large stream also currently used as a fertilizer uh, but also looking to uh, to upgrade this uh, this side stream and their soil is actually the soil which is left on the sugar beet when we process it which is uh, in terms of volume also uh, a stream where we're looking at alternative applications yes thank you eric and then uh, martin van der poel can you explain on the primary sludges? Hello Anita, um, I'm uh, from uh, Crown van Gelder paper mill also. And uh, we have uh, a stream called uh, a primary sludge of our firm. And it consists um, yeah, of 60% uh, of water, 40% dry ten content. And of the dry content, 50% is uh, uh, inorganic. It's the filler, calcium carbonate. 50% is uh, paper fiber, so this organic. Uh, and now it's used uh, as, a, as an anti dust uh, substance for a coal and coal storage at the moment. We're looking for other and better and uh, improved uh, um, uh, treatment. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. And, and maybe Cor Wintjes, can you, because you have the inking sludge? Uh, which is, well, slightly different because it also contains some ink. <laughs> yes, you're, you're right. Um, the, the, the inking sludge or paper sludge is coming from cleaning, screening, washing and flotation steps from the process for making uh, uh, paper coming from uh, waste paper, uh, collected waste paper, but uh, as it uh, is from waste paper, it, it it also contains a small parts of plastics and also the the deinking, yeah, the ink from the deinking. Um, fifty percent uh, moisture in our case, fifty thousand uh, forty to fifty thousand tons, fifty percent uh, fibers, small and long, and the rest are the coming from the fillers, the minerals, like uh, in part one is explained. Yeah. Thanks. Well, these I think are the, the main categories and well, we have um, challenged um, the technology suppliers to to see whether well these fit. 
So we have well, we have nine technology suppliers who will pitch today. Um, after four of them, we su suggest to have a short break um, because otherwise we will have a really long session. So after the break, we will continue with the last five and then afterwards we will have a discussion with experts. Um, and we ask them all to pitch for um, seven minutes. I will have a clock here because um, yeah, the, tight, the time is uh, tight, so we will definitely stop you after seven minutes. Um, we asked them, as I told you, to, um, to grade them. Uh, this is just a, a suggestion like, OK, uh, um, which of those streams is most suitable for um, uh, for the technology, is it suitable, suitable after pre-processing and tolerable? So we asked all the technology supplier to include this in um, in their pitch, so that um, at the end we all also know um, uh, uh, this. So um, I'll I'll just stop sharing this, and in the meantime, um, um, yeah, we 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 are um, uh, uh, we we are happy that we uh, already. Uh, got quite some of the presentations, so my colleague Davy already started to fill the big matrix. So hopefully, after all the pitches, we are able to set to to provide you with the total matrix and see which of the side streams fit with the technologies. So um, I stop sharing now, and I would like to give the word to the first technology supplier, Alucia. Who of you is going to present? Yeah, that would be me, I guess. Yes, uh, Gijs. Hello, Gijs. Hello. Let me share the, this one. Yeah, and the clock starts. OK, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, oh, we don't see anything. Sorry, I was. Uh, ah, now I see. Ready, uh, uh, sharing. Uh, well, my name is Gijs Jansen, uh, CEO and founder of Alucha. I think some of you uh, might already know me and, and the company and what we do. Um, um, but um, a short introduction of our company. Um, Alucha, we are a developer of, uh, of waste solutions and we actually focus on, on complex waste streams. Uh, actually within the paper industry until now, but also uh, other streams. And uh, our focus is on uh, pyrolysis technology. So heating up without oxygen. Uh, that is um, where, where, where we have developed um, several solutions. We do that together with um, our clients, large corporations, with the actual problem. And also we tend to work together with uh, different knowledge institutes like uh, the University of Twente has played an important role. And also TNO is, uh, is often uh, helping us uh, developing our uh, solutions. Um, we have our office in Arnhem in the Netherlands um, where we also have our lab uh, and workshop. Well, the, our technology is basically designed for complex waste streams and with complex we mean uh, organic components mixed with uh, inorganic components. Um, um, so uh, the process is called uh, pyrolysis um, and in a matter of seconds we can turn this, this, this waste stream uh, into uh, different products. Um, our current focus is on paper sludge, which has been presented as one of the, uh, the problems. The paper sludge mainly consists of uh, minerals, about 50%, and the other 50% is uh, are fibers that cannot be used anymore. This is on dry base, obviously. Um, now, the main uh, solution for paperless now is, is incineration or uh, in a cement kiln, and, and this, this uh, destroys actually the material and uh, generates CO2. Well, we can separate these minerals so that they can be used again in, uh, in all kinds of products. And the, the most of the fibers we turn into bio oils, which on the short term we can use to produce heat. 
but we have already started research uh, projects to uh, to develop this into biochemicals. Um, yeah, so the the inorganic uh, products um, can, are separated, and uh, this can actually this this mainly consists of uh, uh, calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate fillers that have been used in the paper uh, industry originally. And this means that it has uh, quite some interesting features. It is 100% circular and it is produced from post-consumer waste. Um, by recycling it, we keep actually the, the fossil CO2, which is in the calcium carbonate, in the loop. And uh, with this, we, we, we um, achieve most of our savings uh, in, the, in CO2. And this is interesting for uh, potential off-takers of, uh, of CCC, like in the plastics, rubber, and, and paints and coatings industries, because these are industries that, that use the linear fillers at this moment uh, and have a, a increasing pressure to, recycle, to, to increase their uh, recycled content uh, in their end products. Because obviously uh, that is an important part of uh, of the business case of our solution. Uh, what can you do with these end products? Uh, this is where we've been working on uh, a lot in the last uh, years. Um, and uh, we have seen that our circular calcium carbonate can be used uh, in, in different uh, products and actually high value uh, applications such as paints, uh, wall fillers, rubber flooring, uh, different car parts, it is being used in PVC piping. Uh, we have tested compounding in small PP parts and also packaging film normally uh, already contains 10% of, uh, of fillers. Uh, this has also been tested uh, successfully. So if we go back to uh, the, the question and, and what can we do for these waste streams? Well, with paper sludge, we can do a lot. Uh, as many of you, uh, of, of those having sludge, uh, know. And actually, we plan to run uh, production runs next year with our uh, small scale plant. Uh, we call this Mine One. And uh, this is actually a good opportunity to, to test a large amount of sludge uh, for different clients and then also produce large amounts of, uh, of fillers, for example. On the other hand, with new uh, side streams or waste streams, uh, we have our Lucha lab, uh, where for clients we can do small scale tests in our lab, uh, where we would process uh, and analyze the waste sample and also the produced products in order to, yeah, to determine the feasibility of applying pyrolysis to that certain uh, waste stream. Um, these are studies we can, we are doing uh, all year round. Um, and going back to the main question of today, where are potential side streams for our technology? Uh, I didn't make the, the nice table, uh, unfortunately, but if I go to these categories that were presented, obviously the last one with the high percentage of inorganics is one that we uh, would be most suitable. Um, also, the first one, although that depends on, on the water content, uh, we could consider like digestates and, and uh, all other sludges. And we have quite some experience in, uh, in mixed plastics in the third category, um, also from paper mills. We have uh, in our previous project, we have uh, built up a lot of experience in recycling of drink cartons. Uh, we looked at uh, different uh, mixed plastics waste streams. So we can definitely suggest uh, solutions there. Thanks. Your that was time it. is over. Yeah. OK. You have one last slide probably with maybe your contact well, details. Ah, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we will I didn't how make I, the table. I didn't yes, make always good. We will share the slide so that people also know. I see a question popping up. Um, yeah. How about other minerals? They will end up in the calcium carbonate and lower the value. Do you have experience with other minerals? Well, it's a good question. Um, obviously, what comes in 
goes out. So uh, if there is a mix of minerals in the beginning, it will come out. Uh, we will separate the, the complete mix. What we've seen in, uh, we've tested already many uh, sludge samples, and most of them uh, contain a mix of, um, of the paper making fillers that are being used. So most of these fillers, and I'm not now talking about paper sludge. Yeah, but it's, I think the question is mainly for many other sludges that contain a high amount of inorganics, which are quite often not carbo, uh, calcium carbonate. So, um, well, maybe you can think about it. It's a nice question. Yeah, well, it, it is what what I can what I can say is that it it uh, if there is the 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 end product which we cannot change because we just separate uh, that will determine its end value. So it's a it's a complete mix of all kinds of minerals. Yeah. Uh, it will have its impact on uh, its value. Yeah. yeah. No, th thank you very much, Gijs. I would like to continue with the next speaker, and you can stop sharing. The next one is Tymen Tymen de Vries from BioBTX. Yes, good afternoon. So share my screen. Yes, we see Does it. it work? Thank Perfect. you, Tymen. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so my name is uh, Tymen Fries. I'm working at BioBTX. And at BioBTX, we developed the technology to convert biomass and end of life uh, plastic waste streams into the renewable uh, aromatics. Uh, let's see. And what you see here is the, the our pilot plant. Well, really proud of it, uh, but I will tell you more about it. Um, the, as background, um, to substitute for all, uh, well, everything that we see around us is based on carbon. And to substitute for the fossil based carbon, uh, which we use nowadays mostly, um, we will need new resources um, to uh, where, where we can uh, supply the carbon from. So this can be bio-based, uh, CO2-based or from recycling. And as BioBTX, we're active in the bio-based and the recycling uh, part. Well, then what, what do we do as uh, BioBTX? Well, the, the technology that we develop makes uh, full carbon circularity possible, we all say it, and um, we're producing from these uh, waste streams aromatics, uh, so benzene, toluene, xylene, which are nowadays produced out of fossil resources. Well, and um, we see that this is, that this, the technology is key in achieving circularity as we're uh, substituting for fossil resources by renewable. Well, the technology that we uh, developed is also pyrolysis based, um, but then um, after the pyrolysis, we have an extra step and we call it the upgrading step in which we produce uh, the BTX mixture. Well, if we then look at what types of inputs can we use and what do we like? Well, um, everything that contains carbon uh, can be processed within our, uh, with, with the technology into uh, of can, can be processed. So you can think of yeah, plastic mixtures of PE, PP, PET, uh, polystyrene, ABS, but also uh, bio-based waste streams as glycerol, uh, cellulose, lig lignin, um, uh, wood, um, cocoa, what is it, cacao nuts. Um, well, it, we, we, we screened a lot of different types of uh, feedstocks to uh, to test and to see how it uh, converts into uh, benzene, the aromatic benzene to a xylene. Well, the technology that we developed is, as I said, uh, pyrolysis based. Um, and then uh, thereafter, there's a catalytic conversion. So we separated the thermal cracking and the catalytic conversion. And therefore, we are able to uh, work with contaminated waste streams. Um, uh, the, it, it extends the the lifetime of the catalyst, um, uh, we are therefore, uh, there's a high uh, feed flexibility. Um, we are able to work with uh, metals and fillers in the in the feedstocks. Um, and well, then it gets more chemical, but there's also no need for hydro treating of the product afterwards. Um, so this is what we all see as uh, 
of the benefit of our technology. And then as an output, we are producing uh, yeah, the benzene, toluene and xylenes, um, which are nowadays produced out of fossil resources. Uh, so we're making a drop-in uh, product, which can be directly used in the current existing uh, chemical industry. Um, and how we always explain it is that the, the, the BTX are the, the Lego uh, building blocks of the chemical industry. Uh, so it depends on the end user what they want to make out of it. Um, but uh, we are able to make uh, the building blocks itself. So what you see here is that um, in 2016 we made the first 100% bio-based uh, PET. And last year with Tage and Aramid we made 100% uh, bio-based aramid fiber. So even uh, the upcycling of uh, mixed plastics into even higher uh, valued uh, end applications. Well, then um, the scale, uh, of course, is also important. Well, the, the first slide I showed was our pilot plant, which we were able to convert uh, kilograms per hour. Um, and we have the goal to have the first commercial industrial scale plant of, uh, operational in 2024, in which it will convert 20,000 uh, tons, so 20 kilotons of uh, post-consumer mixed plastic waste. Um, and we are planning to scale that up towards uh, 50 kilotons in 2027. Um, so quite some amount, so we can uh, use uh, well, different types of waste streams to um, uh, eventually produce uh, to meet the, the, the demand of, uh, of the plant that will be, operation, will be operating. Then here, uh, the overview of the, the, uh, the possible input streams. And as I said in the beginning, if it contains carbon, we can process it. Uh, but it depends on uh, the, the, the convertible content, let's say, in the, um, in the feedstock, how efficient it will be. But um, as long as it contains carbon, we, uh, we are able to convert it. And then related to the, uh, the, well, the last category, the, the lime and the calcium oxides, uh, these are we are not able to process them into uh, BTX, but we can use them uh, in the process itself for different types of applications. So this could also be very interesting. That was it, I think. Well, nice. yes, well within the time, you still have half a minute left. So uh, yeah. <laughs> great, well done, well done. Let's see whether there are any questions. Um, from Mick Modderman from Table Den, he says, hello, Time, and you mentioned a lot of feedstock waste to convert to BTX. Can this be done all at once or per batch or different processes? Uh, well, it, it could be mixed, but um, uh, we are now working on uh, or working with a mixture of different types of plastics, but we can also use um, mixtures of biomass and plastics and uh, or only biomass or different types of biomass and each type of feedstock has its own uh, optimal uh, process. process conditions yeah say. i understand uh, yeah but the uh, the process itself proved well it's yeah it is we can uh, we can operate it with different types of feedstock yeah and then the question is do you need external energy for the process well for the um, um we well in 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 these uh, pyrolysis types of uh, uh technologies we're producing uh, oil so we are producing this btx mixture but net, next to an oil you're also making uh, uh, a gas stream uh, ah, so and that is your energy source and this is this can be your energy uh, supply but you can also uh, supply it to uh, well, third parties who are interested in these. Um, because that yeah. was also my question. Do you have any side streams left? But most of them are used then either as an energy yeah, source. So for the, um, well, on, on pilot scale, we are, uh, uh, these, it is all just with, with, uh, with electricity powered. So we're not 
using the gases to convert it back to an energy, but on commercial scale, we will uh, or supply uh, the gases to uh, to a third party or maybe use a part of it for our own uh, heat. Yeah. I get a lot of there will be an excess yet. of gas available. Sorry, I think uh, you need to choose maybe to the question you would like to answer because I get a lot of questions. Um, that is, uh, what's the maximum water content and what's the maximum chlorine level that you can use? Yeah. So please answer them quickly because well, we have to go. Yeah, the maximum water content is of course a hundred percent, but uh, we well we don't like the water because it would cost energy okay. to heat it up, and yeah, it will end up somewhere. So it yeah. is not efficient, um, but of course, if it's if it uh, from an economical point of view makes sense to uh, use a waste stream which is 99% water and 1% carbon, then it it would be possible. But yeah. um, I think this won't uh, this won't happen. <laughs> but, chloride. Uh, chlorides. Well, we don't uh, really li uh, like them, um, but when you uh, use the calcium oxides. Um, Maybe together with the, the chlorides, you can even um, uh, maybe even handle those. Um, so this could be a, a, even a solution uh, then. Yeah, and there's one question. What do you do with the solid product in the pyrolysis stream? Yeah, so the, 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 um, the, uh, in the first step where we do the pyrolysis, there is a char fraction which is uh, yeah, created. So all the metals and inorganics will end up there. And if someone has a real uh, good uh, solution for that part, then. Uh, yeah, feel... well, maybe that's a good one. Please answer that one in the chat. So if you have solution, there are many, and there are also questions yeah. in the chat that have not been answered yet. So, Tyman, if yeah, you could feel, answer them yourself. Feel free to uh, e send an email to. Uh, yeah, but you can also uh, answer the things yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Then I would like to go to the next one, which is Carbonautin. So this is either Alex Sanchez or Michael or um, Serna Tinger, who is going to present? It's me. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you are Michael. I'm Michael, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will start your seven minutes now. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, I can say we could use the the char fraction that you are producing. So we get in contact with you afterwards and we can maybe Perfect. have. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so we at Carbonauten, we are the minus CO2 factory and we help industry and municipalities with decarbonization and at the same time to save costs. The technology or the system we are using is actually quite simple. So biomass is storing CO2 from the atmosphere through uh, photosynthesis processes. And in the natural cycle through rotting and burning, all the greenhouse gases go back to the atmosphere. That's why we also have a paralytic carbonization. And um, this leads to different fractions. So on the one hand, we have the biocarbons. On the second, we have the renewable energy that we just heard um, with the, the gas fraction that we can use for um, purposes, for heating purposes and um, also for electricity, renewable energy, and as a third fraction, we have the pyrolysis oil um, that can be used in the agricultural sector, but also, as we just heard, um, for as a um, yeah ground material for um, bio um, economy. But our main focus is on the biocarbons because we use these biocarbons and bring them in combination with other binders, for example, polymers, silicates, minerals, but I will come to that later, to produce our net materials. And here we always store the CO2, which is stored in the biocarbons, and we also substitute fossil parts of the original material so that we have a really climate positive material. And the disruptive idea behind that is the more we produce, the better it is for the climate, and for the environment. We can use different kinds of waste streams, so we can use all kinds of woody materials, which is lumpy, um, like sawmill residuals, screen overflows, 
um, but also waste wood. And we already tested paper rejects and paper sludge. So that's also interesting. And also I heard we had one paper mill here with us. So um, there we can, for example, make a combination of giving the energy from the process to the paper mill so that they can decarbonize the, the energy consumption. And then in the same time, use the paper sludge to um, get it carbonized and make a new material out of it. Um, we we already tested that in lab scale with the paper sludge and it, we have good results. But the question is now what how to use the biocarbons out of this paper sludge. Maybe we can use it in the in the construction sector but we have to um, finalize the products in for with the paper sludge so we can basically use mostly um, the biomass also with contaminants of small amounts of plastic and metals and for sure the grass and the prunings are very suitable for our processes so um, what we are doing as a business model is not that we are providing any technology. We are coming and making a contract with you either in the offtake of your biomass, of your waste biomass, and then we simply buy it or take it from you and um, run the process by ourselves. Or we can, if you need energy, then we can make energy contracting and we can insert you decarbonize and very competitive um, green technology at uh, green energy in kind of thermal energy up to 850 degrees or in kind of electricity but also we can if you have um, certain processes um, where you can need the net materials or if you have interesting binders we can also process the net materials in your or we can um, develop net materials for your purposes. So the, um, beside taking off your waste streams, one of the most important parts is to um, offer you decarbonized renewable energy without investment, because we are doing all of the investment. We are doing all of the operations of the of the blend so that you don't have to worry about anything and just do the offtake of the of our renewable energy which is base loadable but now i already promised you to show you some samples for the net material so here you see different kinds of plastic material films biodegradable plant pots but also biodegradable films are possible um insulation material and so on so a very very wide range of products that we can address with our biocarbons with our net materials here you also see uh, biogenic coke which you can use in incinerators to substitute fossil coke um, but also granulate for injection molding and so on so we have a very wide variety of products that we can produce and where we can substitute the fossil material and we bring new characteristics to the material so that you can increase the 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 product um, in what kind of uh, yeah different kind of um, characteristics and you always store co2 so you can even make your product co2 neutral or even climate positive um, we have a decentralized modular system which we place um, where we have the access to the to the biomasses and where we have the offtake of the energy. So we are searching for different locations where we can set up our factories. At the moment, we are setting up our first industrial plant next to Berlin in Germany. Um, and we will start operating there by the beginning of next year. Okay. Time's over. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we would no. love to get in contact with you. Just in time. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I don't see direct uh, questions.
questions in the chat, but I was wondering because uh, I heard that you do, you have your own technology, you don't sell it, but you buy streams the, and you also sell your own products. Yes. So the only thing you are searching for is raw materials. Yes, we are searching for raw materials and we are searching for someone who needs decarbonized energy. Okay. And but they need to be in your neighborhood. No, we come to you. <laughs> you install the technology at the location. Exactly. When they oh. need, uh, when oh. they need uh, um, the renewable heat, we install the our factory next to your factory. Um, when you need electricity, then we can also be somewhere else because that's easily to transportable. But heat is always um, hard to transport. Um, so we um, install it directly next to your facility. Yeah, well, that sounds good. I already see pe 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 people in the chat that uh, that over over you some uh, some streams Perfect. and ask you to make a quotation. Well, please stay within the competition guidelines. So don't don't do the whole negotiation via the chat because that's not allowed in this meeting. But uh, anyhow, there are people who are interested to be in contact uh, with you. Question from Walter Menting is what is the minimum capacity input of the plant? So, um, as we are modular, we have at least three modules, and with three modules, we need um, 15,000 or so 15,000 tons of um, residual biomass or yeah, waste stream, dry waste yeah. stream. Okay. And then we can, um, de depending on the quantity of energy that is needed and on the quantity of um, waste stream that is there, we can simply scale up with new modules. Oh, good. And I see that I missed a few questions. Have you tested processed waste wood like MDF and glue wood? Yeah, that's um, that's no problem because that's uh, yeah like a chemical recycling, and then we can simply um, use the the glue um, for um, yeah it will go into the oil, and we can use it also in the in the gas. Yeah. So there are no no problems with that. Yeah, and then there are a few other questions, but I would like to ask you to go to the chat and, and answer them because, um, yeah, there are quite good. And you have to scroll up a bit because there are more questions uh, going up. So please watch carefully what <laughs> questions have been uh, been there. So, um, uh, uh, so here uh, there's one question I would like to ask is this, this biochar, Mm -hmm. your your net material can be used one to one in plastics just the answer yes or no um yeah yeah we have our special composition but yes yes okay well you can provide some uh, more details than in the in the chat because i think a lot of people would like to know more okay, thank you for that i think um and then I would like to go to the next speaker before we go to um, the break, which is DBG. Yeah. Bioenergy. And who will give the presentation? Oh, Lara, it's you. Yeah, I will give the presentation. One second. Thank you. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lara Labutic. I work as a sustainability coordinator for DBG Bioenergy. We are a company based uh, in Amsterdam, and as you can see, we specialize for processing and upgrading of paper sludge uh, into different valuable products. Uh, we will see that later on. But first, let's take a look into some basic uh, facts regarding the current uh, paper sludge disposal practice. So on EU level, there are approximately 11 million tons uh, of primary paper sludge produced each year. And as it was already mentioned before, majority is uh, either incinerated or placed into landfills. However, these two methods are becoming increasing, increasingly more costly and they also come with more and more stringent uh, regulations around them, which is why uh, uh, many are looking for different solutions nowadays. Uh, luckily for us, paper sludge is continuously, feed, continuously available feedstock, so it is produced at uh, steady rates throughout the entire year. 
and it has a uh, high energy density um, so it has four times higher energy density than manure um, as we will see however if you would uh, process uh, paper starch through regular anaerobic digestion digestion process there are certain challenges that first need to be overcome so as we all know, uh, as a residual material coming from pulp and paper industry, paper sludge is known for having a high lignocellulosic content between 40 and 60 percent of cellulose. Um, also, depending on the different paper making process, it contains traces of lignin and it can have a high uh, ash content on dry bases. Now, the paper making process itself, uh, it already partly degrades the cellulose fibers and after which they are exposed and they form uh, something uh, like a, a, a web like structure. And this specific arrangement is known for having a particularly high uh, water holding capacity. And this is what causes uh, viscous behavior of paper sludge. Uh, in other words, it is extremely challenging feedstock to, uh, for me mechanical handling. So mixing or pumping, uh, this is all very difficult. In addition to that, the cellulose fibers are physically protected by lignin. So the microorganisms in anaerobic digesters are unable to access the, the full organic material which is contained in the paper sludge. As DBG, uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, we do. Because I'm unable to. OK, I'll do it like this. As DBG, <laughs> as DBG uh, we created a solution for this. So this is a representation of our process. And one of our plants is designed to treat uh, up to 270 tons of paper sludge each year. But before we uh, put this material into AD reactor, we first pre-treat it uh, with a novel technology called uh, Epicellulas XT. Now this is enzymatic, uh, enzymatic pre-treatment, so biological process executed in aerobic conditions at 37 degrees, and this is where paper sludge stays for two days. After this, we are able to uh, significantly improve the biomethane potential and we reduce the viscosity significantly. So then we put the paper sludge into the, the bioreactor. And after that, uh, we have two major streams. One is uh, biogas, which we clean, we upgrade and we liquefy it. And we get 14,000 tons of bio LNG. And the main byproduct of this process is liquid CO2. And the other major stream is the digested, which we are able to upgrade into uh, organic fertilizer. All of these products have high demand and already well-established uh, markets nowadays. Furthermore, if we look at the technical performance comparison of the DBG's process with uh, commonly used waste to energy techniques, and we observe uh, important parameters. We can see that, uh, for example, the, the temperature conditions we use, uh, we have a significantly lower temperature range required, which implies a low energy consumption process. We are able to reduce almost uh, entire uh, volume of the feedstock. Uh, we create two main extremely valuable products on the market. And even in our byproduct, which is liquefied CO2, we are able to uh, create value from it and we are able to sell it as uh, food grade CO2 or uh, for greenhouses or industrial uh, purposes. Our process produces non pollutants compared to other uh, technologies. And if we look at the heating value of the end product, uh, which for us the main energy product is bio LNG, it is clear that we are able to recover. Uh, significantly more energy uh, compared to, for example, co-combustion of paper sludge with municipal solid waste, with the end product being steam. And furthermore, if we go slightly more into depth and compare uh, our solution with co-incineration of paper sludge with municipal solid waste, and we make one-to-one -one comparison, so the same capacity for each plant, our process is uh, resilient to uh, high moisture content uh, in paper sludge. That's why we are able to 
uh, process 100% of paper sludge, whereas in the other scenario, the limit that you would be able to process is 25%, uh, mainly because moisture negatively affects the combustion characteristics, the efficiency of the mixed fuel and the amount of residual mass left. Uh, if we observe the lower heating values of the inputs and outputs of the both process, again, the emphasis is on the, the energy recovery that we are able to achieve. Furthermore, we, one of our plants saves uh, nearly 78,000 tons of CO2 each year, and this is according to uh, RED2 certification. And uh, our business model works in a way that our pr the, the prices uh, for, for our clients are stable and reliable, whereas in the other situation, the prices are unpredictable and they're only expected to continue to increase. Uh, like I said before, uh, from our products, we create value. So both for, for Your time is uh, over, Lara. No problem, no problem. Yeah. Uh, this was actually the, the last slide. And, oh, that's good. And that's good. Here, here we do have QR codes, and for whoever is interested, I can send the full version of the presentation and answer additional questions. And I just wanted to show this. Yeah, uh, great. like you asked. So we are still, uh, we are specialized in treating the primary paper sludge. And as you can see, there are certain feedstocks that are suitable for our process. But currently we are looking into paper sludge. Yeah, thanks. Um, one question um, from Crown van Gelder, one of the paper mills, is that they have wood free. Um, Sludge, which means that there is no lignin in there. Is this enzyme step then still needed? Uh, yeah, it's needed, but it, for us it's even better if it's mm. if there is no lignin inside. And I was questioning because they they indicated that there is well half of the the solid part is calcium carbonate. What do you do with that? Uh, well, at the end we uh, we filter it, so we are able to separate it from the the. The digested in our process when we uh, yeah. when we filter it, we are able to extract the calcium carbonate, but we don't have significant amounts so far. Yeah, well, at least half of the stream is calcium carbonate, so maybe you can align with Alucia because they would love to have it. Yeah, certainly. Yes. Anyhow, there is another um, uh, question in the chat also whether it would work on lignocellulosic feedstock as well, but maybe you can answer that question directly in the chat because mm -hmm. I would like to start with a short break because we have still five pitches left after the break. So um, we'll be back in five minutes. Perfect. Thanks.
So one more minute. Well, it is 21 minutes past three. So time to, um, to continue with the last five pitches before we go into the discussion. I would like to continue with DOPS. Um, it will be either Roland Jan Dijkhuis or Wiebe Pronker, who will be the one presenting? Yes, it is uh, Wiebe Pronker presenting. I will share uh, my screen. Yes, this works yes. good. Yeah, you okay. have minutes start now. Okay, thank you, uh, ESPT, for giving us the possibility to uh, present our process and DOPS. Uh, my name is Wiebe Pronker, I'm one of the founders. Uh, the direct carbon immobilization process uh, is based on a refractory structure, uh, the orange in these uh, drawings, uh, and we have a central carbonization channel uh, within this the shaft where we enter the waste from the top and the solid residue comes out at the bottom. <coughs> the, there is no oxygen uh, in the process here, so there is powerless gas and that goes the only way out is to the combustion channels that are around the shaft and there we inject some oxygen to partly combust the, the syn gas or the powerless gas uh, to keep up the heat of the process. So it's a very simple structure uh, just of refractory bricks uh, with those channels. It's a high temperature pyrolysis carbonization process. The process conditions are completely anoxic for the solid waste stream. Uh, partially oxic, but still reducing in the combustion channels. Uh, we have a temperature uh, above 1000 degrees for the solid waste. Uh, and for the gas phase, we can go up to 1400, 1500 degrees. The pressure inside the reactor is close to atmospheric and the residence time is 18 to six, eight to 16 hours, depending on the size of the installation. That makes it go very slow, but it allows a uh, very heterogeneous uh, waste stream uh, inside our reactor. The process is uh, fully scalable. We can build uh, small scale uh, reactors for uh, below a ton a day. Uh, they can be mobile, uh, but the size of the shaft and the number of shafts can be uh, extended. Uh, and we can go up to installations of uh, up to a million tons per year 
of the process, uh, like coke plants do in the steel industry. And that's uh, where the technology comes from. Uh, the concept is derived from the coke making industry. Uh, and an alt another idea was the uh, production of carbon electrodes uh, also for the metal industry. Uh, at this moment, uh, we have done uh, mass and energy balance calculations. We have thermochemical simulations uh, done. Uh, we have discussed the refractory materials with uh, suppliers. We are in the process of uh, preparing lab tests at the University of Delft. And we are designing a, a pilot installation in a 20 foot container size, which you see here. So for the basic mechanism, the TRL level is nine, uh, but for us, uh, we are at this moment at three, but soon growing to six. Uh, our process is very tolerant for load variations. Uh, we can vary the load from 30% till 100% of full capacity. Uh, we can keep the installation hot idle. We are uh, tolerant for moisture content. Uh, up to 20% of moisture we can dry with the residual <coughs> energy from the process. And up to 75% moisture we can uh, dry using the energy in the sim gas for drying. Contaminants in the uh, process, we break them down or we separate them. So heavy metals uh, that come in the, the carbon, zinc, arsenic, uh, they come with the thin gas and are catched there. Uh, persistent hydrocarbons, uh, PAX, PCBs, PFAS, dioxins, they are all broken down. And we don't need any pretreatment other than taking the really large parts out of the waste stream. And large parts are 40 centimeter and, and up. So when we look at the suitability table, uh, we can process a lot for the moisture waste streams. Uh, we uh, we dry them with residual waste. Uh, the really wet ones, we might have to dry them with some uh, syn gas uh, combustion. Uh, high metal content is not a problem. Sand load or plastic or paper contaminations are not a problem. The heaviest grid, as long as at least 20% of hydrocarbons are in the material, we can process it. And the heaviest shoot, as we understood it, there are hardly any hydrocarbons in it, so that's hard to process for us. But they are tolerable in the installation. Um, well, here about the same uh, picture. Microplastics, uh, mixed plastics, also with uh, composites, uh, thermohardes, uh, uh, fiber reinforced. We can all process that very well. And uh, <coughs> fats and greases, uh, we can absorb them with uh, carbon uh, pellets we can make from our residue. So also wet concentrates we can process as long as there is enough hydrocarbons inside it. The same is for the tar soils. And with the high mineral uh, waste streams, uh, we can process, the, process them as long as there are enough hydrocarbons to, uh, to keep the process running. So what are our products and residues? Of course, this depends on the composition of the waste. Uh, we make a Sorry. thin gas. Your time is over, so okay. can you quickly finalize this slide? Okay, we make thin gas. Uh, we have to uh, clean the thin gas so we get some salts or acids. And we have solid waste, uh, solid residue from carbon, which we can really uh, separate well. Because of the carbon, we can uh, we can grind it and uh, uh, sieve it and make it separate. I Thank go to the 
last slide then. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I don't see questions yet in the chat, but I'll make it easy. Can you tell something about the markets? Uh, you yes. Can go two slides up. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, well, just tell about the markets. Yes, well, we uh, we think uh, on industries which has uh, specific waste streams, but also we uh, look at uh, leisure parks, at uh, uh, harbor terminals or Schiphol. Uh, yeah, you, you mean about for for the, the the side streams? No, for the for the uh, mainstream for the for the no for the for their waste streams. Yeah, OK, but what about the products? Why okay. do you sell? Do you have market available for the for the products that you produce? Yes, the syngas, uh, we can make methanol of it. Uh, and that's a uh, feedstock for the uh, chemical industry. Yeah. Uh, carbon is, uh, can be used as uh, uh, ground fertilizer or, uh, well, ground improvement. They absorb uh, uh, the minerals. But we would like to harvest the me metals from them with pyrometallurgical processes. Mm -hmm. I see a question on how much carbon is in the solid residue. Uh, that depends on the waste, but it uh, can be uh, from 20% uh, uh, till over 60%, 80%. Clear. And here you see a very high temperature over 1,000 1, degrees. Isn't that very energy intensive? Uh, well, it's very good to uh, insulate the, the reactor. Uh, and there is not much energy going out because it's a countercurrent process. We, ha we have most of it uh, back in the uh, back in the process or we keep most of it in the process. OK, clear. Well, you can also then look at the questions in the chat and answer them and stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Um, because then we go to the next one, SCW Systems, SCW Systems, and it's Frans Korndorf or Wouter Groot? Who is going to do this? Frans, apparently. Yeah, it is yeah. uh, uh, Frans. So let me see if I can uh, share my... Uh, Presentation. So, uh, can you see it? Yes. Then your time starts now. I'm starting now. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thanks as well for uh, having me uh, in this meeting and uh, being able to explain a little bit uh, on what we are uh, doing in, in Alkma, uh, in uh, the company SEW uh, Systems. My name is Frans Korendorfer, by the way. Uh, I am the head of the, uh, the research in SEW Systems. Um, and in the company for uh, only a little bit more than a year. Uh, but that's already um, yeah, quite a period of time if you look at the, the total lifetime of the company because the company is still in a, a start-up um, uh, situation. Um, what you can see here is actually uh, our premises in, uh, in Alkmaar. Um, and that is where we are at the moment building a, a supercritical uh, water gasification uh, factory. So talking about supercritical water, what is <coughs> so interesting about uh, supercritical water? Well, first of all, uh, if you want to reach uh, supercritical water, you need to add energy uh, and this energy you need to add in sense of uh, pressure uh, and temperature. And as you can see here in this uh, little picture, uh, you uh, the point of getting supercritical is uh, at 221 bars, 
and about uh, 374 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. So <clears throat> then what it turns into a supercritical uh, situation and what is now the, 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 the nice uh, feature about having uh, supercritical water uh, that has mainly uh, re that is mainly related to the fact that the dielectrical constant uh, of the water goes down uh, tremendously compared to uh, water in in uh, below uh, supercritical conditions. Um, and because of this changing dielectric constant, uh, it is it is possible to. Um, uh, to, to cut large molecules into uh, little molecules. Um, and if you do it in the right way, you can even cut them down to, uh, to gas, to syn gas. Uh, and the other good thing uh, is that if you have uh, salts present in the feed, uh, they, uh, they fall out. So because the, the solubility of salts in supercritical water uh, almost uh, drops down to uh, to zero. So without going into uh, very much technical uh, detail uh, because of the fact that we are still uh, uh, in, in a phase that we are uh, building up uh, and, and still trying to uh, uh, to prove uh, the, 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 the concept. Um, but I will uh, go through at least uh, the four uh, major steps uh, of the process. First of all, of course, uh, we are uh, dependent on uh, people that are able to <coughs> to provide us with uh, with uh, feed. Uh, in principle, that will be done by uh, by truck, um, and we can of course handle, and that will come later, all kinds of different uh, types of uh, feed. The good thing is, uh, of course, because of the, uh, the, the, the process is that we can handle feed uh, that has uh, 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 well a lot of water uh, in. And so we can go up to maybe 90% or even more uh, water uh, without any, any problem. Um, there is uh, one big thing, uh, and that is that we try to prevent salts uh, going into uh, the factory. The factory, by the way, uh, is uh, providing a continuous uh, process. Um, so everything that, uh, that goes in uh, needs to go out and to make sure that we will not plug uh, the factory or that we will have no corrosion uh, issues. Uh, we have a huge um, uh, preparation of the feed uh, up front, if needed, uh, of course. So then when the feed goes in, it needs to be at uh, the supercritical uh, conditions and that of course we do by applying pressure and uh, temperature. Uh, and well, as uh, was discussed in the in the last uh, presentation, uh, that costs a lot of energy, but we try to keep and we are able to keep the energy uh, uh, very well into uh, the system by having uh, very uh, good uh, heat uh, exchanges uh, in the in the factory. So at the moment, uh, when we are at the uh, conditions, uh, well, the, the, let's say the most optimum conditions, um, and these are higher than the 221 bars and the 375 uh, degrees Celsius, by the way, then we will get the conversion of larger, molecule, uh, larger molecules into uh, smaller molecules. And we do that in a way uh, that we try to get as much uh, uh, gas as possible. Uh, so we, uh, at the moment, we are able to, to reach conversions of uh, 99 plus uh, percent. You have half minute left. Yeah, uh, into uh, all kinds of different uh, gases that you uh, can see here. So um, then uh, I went through this little table and uh, by looking at all the green, um, the, all the green colors and, and uh, also the dark green colors, you can see that we can handle quite some uh, different feedstocks. Uh, the ones that, that are really difficult are the ones that 
contain uh, or uh, exist of only uh, solids. That that is really an issue. Uh, but all others, uh, I think we we have certainly very nice possibilities of uh, handle uh, those. Thank you, uh, Frans. Um, my question is, 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 is what is the, the market? Do, do you have already contact with the people that uh, are wanting this, the products that you are producing? Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, we have contact with uh, the uh, the people who are connected to the biofuel uh, industry and the biodiesel industry. Uh, so we want to start off with uh, glycerin, uh, if you like. Uh, but we are also uh, doing research on uh, sewage sludge. Uh, so for us, that is, uh, let's say, uh, the holy grail. Um, and in the meanwhile, uh, we are looking at Finasse, for instance, and uh, uh, or fatty acids, and for these we already have uh, 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 people that can deliver the, uh, the 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 amounts that we need. Yeah, yeah. I see a question uh, from Bart Schweineburg. Um, he says salts and mineral removal upstream could be quite difficult. Is it only corrosion issues that would prevent sending it to the subcritical reactor? Well, it is, of course, uh, the, the corrosion is a very, uh, uh, um, a very important issue, especially if you look at chlorine. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, removal of the solids uh, before it goes into uh, the reactor, uh, just because of the fact that it falls out at supercritical conditions. Uh, but in principle, what we are building here uh, next to the factory is a very large uh, and complex um, uh, plant for uh, the uh, pretreatment of the feed uh, and on the other side uh, a treatment of the gas that comes out and treatment of the uh, the wastewater that comes out but we will we will do that uh, in 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 our own company good well you can also answer to the to the questions that are in the chat um, because there are more, more questions coming in. Um, thanks for that. And then I would like to go to the next one, which is Stork. Either Willem Hasenberg or Yemeng Wang, who is going to present. Yemeng Wang, it's you. Um, I think it's Willem Hasenberg but I'm still waiting for him to unmute it himself. Um, yeah, yeah, I also don't. Are you there, Willem? Yeah, I'm there. OK, it's good. It's yeah. And now I have a screen. My PC was a little bit slow to see the screen. OK, you see it. Yes. You have it? Yeah, your time starts. OK, no. So we have a concept, uh, we call it green and then green. Uh, I'm a senior consultant by Stock SME, and we're looking globally for technologies. Uh, and one of them is the plasma technology that we I want to produce now. No, you skip it for the time being. Uh, one of the things Stock is looking in is in the hydrogen uh, way to decarbonizing. And what we are looking is to using waste uh, to produce hydrogen instead of using electricity. There's a lot of discussion about it, and we think we can solve two problems. Uh, like one way to create hydrogen, and the second way is to uh, have less, less uh, waste. Yeah. How are we doing it? Uh, we're using a plasma scarification process. I will first go in the, the plasma and then in the feedstock. And so what we are doing, we're building this. Uh, Nice of yeah, plasma gasification. It is 30 meter high, and we are running at 3,000 to 4,000 degrees Celsius, and we totally disintegrate it into molecules uh, components. Uh, also, we don't have uh, combustion, don't have toxic waste or hazardous uh, material. And the final product is fertilized slags. 
Uh, our concept of stock is that we want to build it as a, as a package. Also, every package is 11 tons output. Also, we don't want to make smaller or bigger. So we just make it in numbers of 11 tons. And we have uh, multiple solutions to go there for just the hydrogen or to do it liquefied, or even together with uh, carbon captures, depending about uh, your feed. Also, when you go for plastics, you go for the last one. When you go for bio-based, you can go for the first uh, kind of solutions. Um, it's just similar, it's the same as some other uh, projects we saw earlier today. Also, the, the SPEG is really a, a new kind of technology, but the other technology is just current technology that we have already uh, on the market. Also, we can reusing uh, this. Mm. And this size is a reasonable big, and I think the biggest electrolyzer in Holland is the plant for Nobion. This is 20 megawatt. This is about uh, 25, 28 megawatt what it can produce, and it can produce hydrogen. Uh, 24 hours a day. No. And so what is the feedstock? The numbers uh, using 1220 tons of uh, biomass. In this case, we do the first project in Lancaster. In Lancaster, we're using uh, recycled paper. Uh, no more than 25% of uh, moisture. And this, uh, we don't, we operating atmospheric the, the pressure and we can run 24 hours a day, 355 days. I mentioned already before. Uh, about the theoretical level, the pilot plant we have is a level six. Uh, we want to go for a real demo plant building now in, in Lancaster, and that will be classified as TRL 7. Uh, what kind of ways can we have? Also, uh, Not recycled paper, that's we do the project in the States, but hospital waste, industrial waste, residual waste. Let's go over the next one. I think most, this was the questions from there. It's reasonable, uh, easy to use it. The list, the biomass plastics. And then about the, the market, the hydrogen market is big already at the moment in Netherlands. We have 1.5 million tons hydrogen market at the moment. That's mostly gray. Globally is 70 million ton. Uh, the global exportation is a little bit depending on which report you're reading between 210 and, and 600 million tons. Uh, also, and even that had to be green and the other part was even uh, gray. Also markets, uh, industry high, high temperature, say 300 degrees or higher. Industrial process feed like uh, methanol, ammonia, iron, steel, there's a start in the Netherlands. Uh, transportation, heavy trucks, uh, buses, boats, planes, house heating, like a whole fan case, or seasonal storage. So that's the kind of market that you can use this, uh, this product for. The first target uh, in this project is mobility. And mobility gives the highest price for the hydrogen. Uh, also, no information impact is low. Mm -hmm. What the challenges, what the questions? Also, there's the uh, interface between all the entire process, integration, site, offsite, utilities, and operate and maintain. And that's the way we solve it. And that's also ro our role as Stork and our role as Fluor EPC to, to build this, uh, to this project and to uh, Standardized it. Also, the deal that we make with these developers is okay. We take the technology and we will uh, make it better designs. But then we have the, the rights to build the next five plants. That's a way a little bit our commitment there. Also, this is the way it's done. The government uh, gave us the feedstock. The, the Selena built the gasification island. Uh, the flu engineering designs the, the build uh, integrating plant. Eric Key, the Honeywell, will do the, the oxygen plant. Uh, Stark will have the maintenance uh, and operation of the plant. Munich uh, RE will give the guarantees of, of the performance. And Shell and Iwatani are the offtakers of this project. Also, this project is about I believe, 4 million tons a year, uh, kilos a year, and they will build 19 new hydrogen stations in California for this project. And that are the offtakers for this, uh, this project. We have a similar project uh, in discussion at the moment in Rotterdam uh, port, but they are not so far as this one. So we do 25 years maintenance. It was uh, a few weeks ago the, the signing of Iwatani. That's a big Japanese company about uh, 
guess. So that's the offtake agreements. We have global interest. Also, one in the Netherlands is the Rotterdam area. We work with the team there for a part. We're looking for a three hectare place to build there. We also have uh, interest in other parts of the country of, of the world. Your time is over. Okay, then I should skip this. It's, it's primarily the electrolyzers. And we will anyhow share the slides with the uh, participants, yeah. so that is yeah. good. Yeah, I think the interesting part is that uh, they expect in the States to have a $2 price, and that is about half of the price of electrolyzers. That makes it really interesting to have also the alternatives. Yeah. And maybe that because we have also quite some questions in the chat, so I would also yeah, like yeah. to ask you to, to yeah. answer them. But I was wondering why, why make hydrogen while the syncast directly could also be used as an energy source? Yeah, but you cannot, you cannot use syncast, I understand, direct in mobility or in. Uh, ah. I, mean, I mean, you can you can use it like a metal plant, you, you can possibly be used, using it. But most but of this, you really, yeah, because you are focusing on the transport sector uh, here. No, it is depending on the size. I mean, when we look at Rotterdam, we can go direct to the CO2 uh, pipeline there, uh, in order, or even they will sell it. I believe even uh, even there for the greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse houses. Yeah, um, that's an indeed question. Like, what do you deal with? How do you deal with with the CO2? But it's apparently for the greenhouses. Uh, it's greenhouses, but in uh, yeah. what we do in uh, in California, and that's depending on country by country, uh, we have a negative emission there of I believe 188 uh, CO2. Then they uh, they calculate what's the emission about uh, methane, what's coming from the landfills, and they compensate for that. Yeah, no, that's that's clear. Yeah. But what, do you do with the country. what do you do with the solid output? Um, they think they could use it for road constructions. For road constructions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Well, there's still quite some other questions about the feedstock you exactly use, whether, well, you don't want a paper sludge, but you do use uh, waste paper. But maybe you can answer these questions in the chat. Yeah. And looking at the time, I would like to go to the next presentation of TNO, Davide Mores. I hope you have your uh, presentation ready and you can yeah. share it by now. Yes, great. Thank you, Davide. I, That's fast. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. So I work for uh, TNO. TNO is a not-for-profit research and technology organization. I work in the unit of defense, safety and security. And um, within that unit, I work for the Department of Energetic uh, Materials, focusing on process safety solutions. Doesn't go. Does it go like that? Yes. So with energetic materials, uh, we do not intend uh, batteries, for example but energetic materials can be a solid, a liquid or a gas that contains, uh, that can release a large amount of energy in a short period of time. And because of that, it can be very dangerous. Um, um, energetic materials, uh, normally you think about uh, explosives or ammunition, but uh, you can also think of rocket propellants, fireworks, flares, airbags, all those kinds of materials. Um, what we do in the process safety solutions department, we work with the chemistry at this dangerous condition. So we apply the knowledge and uh, the uh, facilities to work with these materials in the also the not military domain. We do the classification of dangerous goods, we test uh, fertilizers, we have thermal stability or compatibility testing. And with that uh, knowledge and expertise, we perform explosion research or uh, we test chemistry at extreme conditions. Phlegmatization, that is the technology that I will discuss today, um, is uh, a fancy word for saying that you desynthesize uh, an explosive article, in, uh, in our case by adding an agent. And what we think is that uh, we can, uh, with this technology, process a uh, pyrotechnic waste, which is classified in uh, class 1.1, so explosive material, into non-explosive waste. 
And this is very interesting because first of all, it allows transportation of this material in an easier way. It can also be incinerated in the current uh, facilities. And in a step two of the technology would be uh, making uh, this waste uh, more valuable by producing energy or uh, interesting chemicals out of it. How did we come up with this? Well, we did phlegmatization with TNT and munition. So this is technology that we developed for a military domain, and we think it is very interesting to apply it also in a more civilian uh, domain. And the recent uh, uh, news, for example, the third picture uh, is from last Monday, shows that th there is quite some uh, waste in terms of pyrotechnic material that could be benefit from this technology. At this moment, we are uh, making the prototype. We in a lab uh, phase where we uh, are exploring this uh, uh, technology further. So uh, we do the HAZOP, the classification of waste. We are testing the throughput. Uh, what are the dangers? What uh, cannot be done in order to uh, handle safely these articles? And the blue uh, arrows are the process that we are currently uh, investigating. But of course, we are also looking to the future. We want to go to a rather a pilot stage of this technology. We want also to do something uh, with the uh, metals and minerals and everything else that is within this pyrotechnic material. And we are also looking to expand this application. For example, flares that are used in the marine industry or um, airbags or anything else. So this is what I wanted to uh, show you. We have expertise in uh, this kind of chemistry and we are working on it. We are also doing other things when it comes to um, waste valorization uh, for the EDA, that is the European Defense Aid, uh, Agency. We are uh, currently investigating uh, better ways to uh, dispose their waste when they are somewhere in the world instead of pit burning. But there are also uh, companies and for example, we have a company that has an acetylene uh, waste stream on the premises and there is also the presence of syngas. Both acetylene and, uh, and hydrogen are explosive gases, but you can uh, combine them making 18 and 18 is an interesting building block for the chemical industry. So we investigate also these kinds of processes. And this is uh, my presentation. I think I'm quite well on time. Yes, you are indeed. And um, well, thank you very much. I have to say it's impressive. I think we, we did not have any explosive materials in the list, but I'm, no. I'm, I'm impressed about well, that you even can treat this kind of uh, uh, waste, which well, indeed will be there as well. Yes. Um, so that's that's good. A question. Um, no, I don't see questions at this moment, but did you see in those uh, list of streams any stream that you think that that could be handled? As well by your process? Uh, well, I was looking at high percentage of inorganics. Yeah, maybe also uh, 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 water uh, containing uh, metals and minerals. So there are quite some interesting uh, 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 techniques that I saw. Uh, for example, uh, DOPS was very interesting. Uh, too bad that they cannot handle solids because we will have uh, a mud like um, waste, which is ah. not dangerous anymore at this moment. Oh, so you yourself also have a kind of um waste stream yes we are trying to see if we can uh, with some uh, kind of way to, uh, to produce electricity out of it but ideally we want to uh, get the the fancy metals and minerals out of it yeah yeah sounds good and uh, well now i see a question coming in in the chat but maybe you can answer it directly in the chat we're so looking at the time so that sure. is do we have, whether there are any waste streams that could be used as agents 
So please, thank you. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you. Then I would like to go to the last one, which is Torwash Levine de, Le de Leger. I hope I pronounce it correct. Yes, you do. Perfect. I think it is Dutch, but it's complex. <laughs> well, it is, actually, it is French, but I'm oh, Dutch. French. Oh, you are Dutch. OK, that's yeah. good. <laughs> So I'll try to share my presentation. Is this now yeah, we properly? See it. OK. Your time well, starts. OK, thank you. Well, as this uh, the title shows that uh, Torwash is, uh, is a developing technology for the treatment of uh, wet waste streams. And the product that we make is, uh, is, is, is a biofuel. Well, we just talked with TNO and actually uh, this is also partly TNO. Uh, we are a spin-off company from TNO. Last year we, we were founded and three people from TNO in Patton actually this time. We uh, we started the Towers company with the goal to commercialize, to scale up and commercialize the Towers uh, process. Actually, the Towers process is focusing on wet uh, uh, biological wet streams. And the focus up to now is very much on uh, the treatment of uh, sewage sludge. Um, so that could be communal and also industrial sewage sludge. But uh, apparently many other uh, liquid streams, uh, come to that later in the, on the last slide, uh, can also be processed. Um, this is the, the, the current chain for sewage sludge and an average uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant is producing every year 223,000 tons of sludge, which goes to the incineration plant. Uh, for they pay a lot of money for that. Um, if we look how Torwash is attacking this problem, is that we uh, we we try to convert all the uh, the sewage sludge into reusable products. So and we do that on the plant itself. Uh, the three products that that we produce are first biogas. Um, but we use it ourselves. Uh, another uh, product that we produce is, uh, is uh, solid biofuel, which can be uh, used as a fuel in uh, for heat uh, uh, power plants. And also we recover most of the, the phosphate, which is in sewage sludge and makes truvite out of that. Um, if we dive into the, the tor wash process itself, uh, the, and the untreated sludge is uh, is uh, going into our uh, reactor. We don't use any flocculants or anything to, uh, to uh, or any pretreatment. Maybe some some thickening first uh, without additives. And then uh, the sludge is uh, the biological material out of the sludge is is pre is treated in a way that that 50 percent of the uh, of the sludge uh, goes into solution. And the other 50% is uh, is filtered out uh, with a filter press and the press cake itself can be uh, dewatered very efficient efficiently so up to 60% dry solid uh, again without any additives. Um, if we do some post drying, then uh, we end up with a, a, a nice biofuel which is dry. Um, the filtrate water uh, contains a lot of uh, organic material, which is then converted into in a UASB reactor into uh, into biogas. Um, the filtrate then goes to the struvite reactor, which uh, which makes the uh, the phosphate fertilizer. And then the water is clean enough to uh, to be returned to the wastewater treatment plant. So it is completely circular. And um, so we we, uh, we don't have any uh, large transportation of sludge out of the, uh, this, the the wastewater treatment plant anymore. So the level, uh, the TRL level that we are now is 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 uh, uh, TRL six. Uh, test has been performed at the, uh, the the wastewater treatment plant of Almere, which is a pretty large one. And um, the result uh, you can see on the pictures below. Uh, this is the, the the filter cake as it is produced, so it's already pretty dry if you compare it to the uh, to the, the stuff that is coming out of uh, the plant right now. And after drying and pelletizing, we get this nice, very nice uh, uh, pellets 
uh, fuel which uh, can then be easily transported and, and uh, incinerated. The big advantage is, is that uh, the, the, the tr treatment plant itself has a 50% lower cost. Well, we make these three byproducts like biogas, solid biofuel and phosphate. We don't use any uh, fossil uh, chemicals. We hardly have any transport left and that these two lead to a 50% lower uh, CO2 footprint of the, the wastewater treatment plant. The next step started in uh, last August where we do a, the scale up and we go uh, have a scale up of uh, uh, 10 to 20 times. And now we are going to build a, a demonstration plant in, uh, in uh, the south of the Netherlands with uh, the partners that are mentioned below. The outlook is that after the demonstration plant, we, uh, we, we will uh, move to a full scale plant and uh, which uh, is not that difficult because we work on in a modular way. Um, and that brings us in, in 2024 when we uh, plan to go to market. If you look at the waste streams that uh, that uh, can be processed, anything that is pumpable and biological is uh, can be treated in a towash reactor. So that means that uh, that of course uh, aerobic biomass, but also digestate uh, is uh, is treated very easily. Uh, manure is is also uh, perfect for the towash process. And uh, recently we tested all kinds of uh, primary sludge. Yeah, from slaughterhouses, uh, but also uh, sludge coming from uh, 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 vegetables. Yeah, so if you crush, for example, uh, pineapple, uh, uh, um, uh, oranges, orange peels, or uh, anything, uh, we can uh, we can make uh, make it work in the towers reactor. Um, the others uh, ha have to be tested. So that's it. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Levine. Um, there is a question. I have to see, at least I see one question. Where do the heavy metals go to? The heavy metals stay in the uh, in in the in the dry solid. So the metals they they uh, they go uh, as uh, 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 they end up as ash from the, the power plant. Yeah, and, and where is the other part of the phosphate going to? The that also stay, that also remains in the uh, in, 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 in the solid part. OK, so Great. yeah, part of this part of this can be recovered about 60 percent and, and 40 percent stays in the, uh, in the solid part in the solid part. Yes. yes, also into the ash of the power plant. Yeah, there is also a specific question on the energy content of your product, but I would like you to write that answer in the chat because then it's also easier yes. to uh, to keep the answer because there may be a lot of people wanting okay. to have that answer. Th thanks a lot for that and you may stop sharing um, because it's time now for um, introducing our um, our experts to um, react on that. So I would like to introduce Sasha Kersten, University of Twente. Please, can you put your camera on, Sasha? And I want to introduce um, yep. uh, Jaap Kiel from TNO. Yes, I see you. Kees Roest. Yes, no, hello, no. Kees. And Bert van der Belt. Yes, hello, Bert. So <laughs> you see Jaap, Kees, Sasha, and, um, um, and Bert. And in the meantime, I would like to show you because my colleagues have been very uh, productive during the presentations because I have a really nice table here with all the, um, the streams we had. And you see that the dark green ones, well, they seem to be at least one technology very suitable. And we have the light green ones which are suitable and we only have a few that are well not suitable or require a kind of uh, pre-processing. Um, Beth, can, can you give some feedback on what you have heard and whether you indeed also see that there are so many technologies being suitable for this? You ask it to me, yeah? Yes, yeah. Beth, yeah. Well, um, 
I was looking at all the different feedstocks and, and our background is mainly on, on thermochemical biomass conversion and with some emphasis on fast process technology. And I must say, if I look at all the feedstocks, they are not so relevant for us. And uh, it's typically the feed stocks we will not consider so it's good that there are alternative technologies uh, we will not compete with that um, the, the, the only exception might be the, the uh, let's say the, the grass and prunings but then in combination with for instance with toros that could be an, an, an one which has a certain could have a certain interest um, then i might make this one dark green as well because it may be of interest for you yeah, and, and of course, we are not a biomass owner. Eh? We, we, are, we don't own the residues. And, and, and to be clear, BG is developing technology and, and uh, certain types of technologies. Uh, we are implementing technology. So in that sense, we are a technology supplier. And um, so most of the feedstock mentioned here are not, uh, are not very suitable for us. Yeah, that, that's clear. But then I would like, but then I go to Sasha. Yeah. Looking into the technology, so because we have those um, uh, those those side streams, and all those owners would like to valorize them a bit better, and mm -hmm. we've seen nice, interesting technologies. And can you say something about those technologies from well, cost-effective, energy-efficient, and sustainable processing point of view? Are you impressed about what you heard today? I'm impressed. Yeah, they're, they're indeed, the list of, of feeds is is enormous. Yeah, I, I count uh, something like 22 in this uh, in this list. I've also seen quite a few technologies, and uh, I'm I'm well. I must also say that these technologies uh, have been out there uh, for quite a long time. Yeah? Uh, uh, many of these technologies are. Hey, now I see something happening on the screen. Um, yeah, just stop sharing because now yeah, we can see uh, you. We also like many to see. of these uh, have been around uh, 25 or years ago or even longer, yeah? and uh, some of them have been well tried in the 80s or even 70s of the last century, and then it stopped for all kinds of reasons. And it's very good to see that these technologies, like working on the hot compressed water, are picked up again. Uh, what I missed a bit in the presentation, and now I, now I put on my my head as a professor at university, is 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 the big step that was made as compared to the developments, uh, let's say, a, a while ago. So I'm I'm very much looking forward to to seeing the next steps of all these technologies and see uh, what the progress is, and uh, if indeed uh, these technologies can be scaled up to a to a level of a first pilot plant or maybe a first demonstration plant. Uh, because that's, I think, in many cases, the step that we still have to take. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can imagine, and I think a, a lot of things, and also in the energy transition, we see that some technologies, when, which may not be feasible 10 years ago, become feasible now, uh, because, because the urgency is getting higher. Uh, we have higher CO2 prices, but we also have um, uh, 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 scarcity in raw materials uh, coming up. So I can imagine that 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 urgency will also accelerate the um, the development of technologies. And um, yeah, can you, you are working at TNO? Do you also see this that you get a higher um, demand for these kind of technologies? Seeing the yeah, yes, I agree to that. So, so uh, you, uh, today we have a whole list of uh, of biomass streams, but of course there are many more and also larger uh, ones. And that really asks for uh, 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 suitable technologies uh, and also at the scale where uh, for for different for individual streams you need multiple technologies to cover the market. Yeah, and there should also be a, a, a competition between these technologies. So indeed, yeah, I think there is room for for many technologies uh, uh, for for different uh, uh, feedstocks for different products. Uh, uh, so we really have to develop uh, that field. Um, when, when, when looking at, uh, at today, yeah, uh, we've seen nine technologies. Of course, there are many more. Um, uh, uh, what I see today is, well, uh, I would say a few observations. Um, uh, first of all, I think what, is, what, is, what should be really stressed is that you need uh, an experimental assessment 
of feedstocks before you can say my, my technology can handle this, uh, this feedstock or not. Uh, so in that sense, I, I consider this uh, overview with a lot of green bars as, as let's say, in, in principle suitable. Uh, could start for experiments. Yeah, yeah and, and it yeah. could be a start for an experimental assessment, but you, yeah. really, uh, you really need that. So, uh, uh, um, and that not only goes for the, uh, the, the process itself, uh, but of course, it also goes for the products. If you, for instance, if you produce carbon-based uh, 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 products, uh, they're not automatically suitable for different applications. Uh, you really have to to test that, and in in many cases also develop those applications. Um, yeah, uh, that was that's I think a very good question, huh? because often if we talk about well, what is the market for these technologies? I got the impression that the technology suppliers were thinking about the um, residual stream owners. But um, what about the market for the products that they are producing? Because that, I can imagine, determines at a large extent whether this, it is feasible. How do you see this market for the products coming out? So the solids, the, the oils, the gases? Um, yeah, also that requires a lot of development still. Uh, for instance, if you take uh, 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 a product like biochar, where uh, a lot, lot of uh, uh, technology developers talk about biochar for, fert for soil improvement, soil, uh, soil fert fertilization. Well, that is easily said, but if you really do the experiments with uh, pot trials and, and, and uh, uh, experiments with plants, then you uh, 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 soon see that uh, 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 really the biochar should fulfill uh, quite stringent conditions uh, uh, in order really to have a, a, a good performance in these applications. So, yeah, so, uh, this, so, so this is quite a route. Uh, uh, you cannot just say, well, I have a, a carbon rich uh, a residue and, uh, and it, it will do. No, in, in most cases, uh, you, you, you need certain process conditions or you need certain post-processing of, the, uh, of the, 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 the carbon rich residue to make it suitable for these type of applications. Yeah, so we should there should be a lot done in 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 checking the requirements set by the application, matching yeah. it with the the, the product um, uh, things. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, in, in that respect, for instance, we're doing a lot with Wageningen University, where you really need this combination of uh, as, uh, looking at different process conditions leading to different uh, properties of the uh, in this case biochar and then doing uh, 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 trials with plants uh, to see whether really uh, it works in practice. Yeah, that's clear. What I, because in the meantime, I'm going to, um, sorry, to share my screen again, because we will also ask some questions to the, um, uh, uh, to the audience. So, well, here's the slide introducing you again, because I forgot to mention where you're from. Uh, Sasha already did as a professor from University of Twente. Yeah, I also in included you. Bert is from BTG World and Kees Roest is from KWR. I will come back to Kees as well. So again, for the people who joined later, please go to polleverywhere.com and fill the code ISPT warmte 673 or you can include uh, you can just scan the QR code which is in the on the screen now and then you can start answering these questions like what do you see as the hurdles in waste stream valorization and well you can read also the answers on the screen like the economic feasibility well the market we already talked about uh, um, Another question is the waste stream market is dominated by waste tra traders, which cause fluctuating prices, transport issues, continuous volume needed, and maybe another. Um, I would like to go to um, case um, because you see that there's often still a stream coming out of those processes. Uh, like, like DBG presented an interesting process, but um, well, ignore the, 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 the mineral stream coming out. How do you see that? Uh, thanks, uh, Anita. And also, uh, I would uh, like to say that it's very nice and good that we have this session today online. 
of course, originally we planned to have it uh, physically, but uh, I'm really uh, positively uh, surprised, I, was, I would say, Me with too. Uh, all the results and the input that we have uh, gained. Uh, yeah. Also good to see that uh, almost all the uh, waste streams, which are currently still expensive or difficult to, uh, to get rid of, actually, uh, they seem to be uh, able to be valorized uh, more or, uh, or less uh, by the technologies presented. And I think um, a lot of technologies still need to make uh, steps. Um, that's also what we intend in ISPT with, uh, with the next uh, uh, steps for, uh, for these technologies and the platform uh, to do pilots and, uh, and demonstrations. Uh, and then we also go to the product in uh, Some products are, of course, easy to valorize. If they can fit in the current uh, valorization uh, streams and the current uh, practices. There are still also a lot of opportunities, um, like uh, the minerals you mentioned and you asked me. Um, sometimes they can be challenging, um, like uh, some salts can cause corrosion or other uh, difficulties in the process. Um, so it's challenging to take them out uh, before the process, but also after the process, a lot of side streams uh, with metals or uh, minerals, they, uh, they are valuable. And for a real circular uh, economy approach, we also should uh, pay attention to them and recover them so that we can really end up with uh, nearly zero waste. Yeah, thank you, uh, Case. I think this is in, in, indeed uh, um quite important thing is that many of the streams still contain those minerals and may often be a, a mixture of that. And looking into them, uh, the answers we got, we see that the majority sees that the economic feasibility is low. I guess this may change because of higher energy prices, higher mat raw material uh, prices, etc. And also some more, well, other incentives for the circular economy. I see you nodding, uh, Jaap. You agree? Yeah, I agree. Uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, you see it for energy applications uh, already, or you could say in general, those sectors where uh, uh, that fall under ETS and where you have a, a carbon tax, a CO2 tax. A uh, CO2 price, I think yesterday it was 70 or even 75 yeah. euros per ton. Uh, so with those prices, uh, these, these, let's say, bio-based concepts, uh, uh, well, several of them are economic already and, and it, it, it helps tremendously. Yeah, so in fact, you're saying we should be ready to take off as soon as it becomes economically feasible and also the urgency gets really high. Yeah, I would like to go then to the next uh, question here. Uh, is, is, um, as in the beginning um, of this, pre this, this session, um, the Chair uh, Jongsma, the director of ISPT, also indicated that, well, ISPT would like to take also this, this responsibility to get this joint development uh, project and to, to um, accelerate such um, technologies. And the question here is, should a joint technology project be set up? And we have a few possible answers, and it may indeed also be other. <laughs> so I see that at least someone says other. I said, yes, let the technology suppliers cooperate, co cooperate in this. Um, yes, for each of the waste stream technology combinations. So that means for each of the crosses. Um, the other one is, yes, preferably one big program with different waste stream owners and different technologies. And that's, of course, to increase also the chances of, uh, of success. Um, and then there are a few, no, there are other development projects already running. No, there are sufficient technologies that are mature enough. Uh, no, I don't think it will be technically or economically feasible and, uh, and other. And well, what I see now is you can continue answering, but at least it seems that the majority thinks at least yes, either for the waste stream technology combination. So for, for, for one of the crosses in the, t in the matrix that we've seen or a bigger program, we'll come back to that one later. Um, uh, Sasha, how do you see this? Yeah, I, I voted for for c but now i'm doubting that maybe b is better or maybe okay share your doubts no see the uh, i think that the 
an overarching program would be good as a, as a knowledge base yeah, that there is some party institute that 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 well this is that is the knowledge base for for many combinations of of, of waste streams and uh, and technologies if you dig deeper uh yeah then you have to start to focus on a waste stream for uh, let's say that is being dealt with in a particular technology which will then be a separate project uh, uh, I think we, we must remember that these waste streams are not easy to handle streams uh, and uh, the technologies are also uh, well, complicated and, and complex. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in fact, the combination between B and C would be wise, a program under which you have specific projects for specific side streams as, as soon as you know enough yeah, see, some which of technology to focus on. Some of the problems will be generic. Uh, uh, for instance, solids handling will be a, a generic problem. Sometimes you have to feed a solid into a system. Yeah, that is a generic problem, which you might try to tackle or try to find generic solutions that can serve different technologies. But, well, for, for most of the technologies I know, they have all their specific issues to be dealt with, and, well, yeah. these require dedicated programs, I would say. Yeah, and then I come back to what Jaap already said. Some experiments need to be done also to, to get the real insights in where the uh, the crosses in the matrix should be put, probably. And maybe... Uh, but I, then, I, think I, I, would, yeah. I would like to add to, to what yeah. Sasha said, that indeed there could be, it, it could be good to have, a, a let's say, a common uh, R&D program to address, let's say, more generic issues. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, that could be related to uh, uh, also to, uh, for instance, the contaminants in various streams and what is the fate of these contaminants in the process and in the products. Uh, also, what you always encounter is issues like fouling, agglomeration, uh, catalyst poisoning, uh, things like that. And, and you come across them in, in, in most of the processes. Yeah, that's clear. And maybe Beth, maybe you can say, because in fact, BGG is also uh, an organization that has more than one technology. Yeah, but to sort of focus on, 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 on fast process. But, but um, if you look at these combinations, um, I'm not sure which is the right one. Um, I do not believe that the technology supplies, uh, the cooperation, what I've seen so far is normally not very effective. Um, if you do it for each waste stream technology combination, it will be a mesh. Uh, that, that's, that there are too many different combinations. One big program with everybody in the same program, I also do not believe. I do believe in a kind of overarching program with individual projects and with certain targets or performance indicators, what should be achieved. What was not very much presented, or I missed it, uh, is, is also a, a kind of economic assessment or, or yeah, good what point. was a reasonable uh, buy fuel price because I think in many cases it will not be economic feasible and you need a certain scale, etc. Um, also, on the other hand, uh, doing nothing is not an option. <laughs> uh, but but I, 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 I think one, one option is indeed missing if there is a, a kind of overarching uh, uh, program with different individual projects. In the end, it will only be efficient if you have individual projects with certain targets. And if everybody, even the competitors, are at the same table, it's a guarantee that there is no exchange of information. No, times. that's always difficult. But I, I like your suggestion about the economics because uh, um, each each technology uh, uh, will, uh, um, a supplier will well calculate it in their own way. So it may be also be good to have a good comparison in this economic thing with real market uh, uh, indications. Uh, yeah. And maybe one other thing to add is, in particular, if you if you are converting waste material, at least that's what we observe, is that uh, regulation plays an important role because once we start to to convert, to even by process, we did uh, uh, waste streams. We tested the, the ashes as a fertilizer, and there are so many regulations in Europe, and and not everywhere it complies. So I, I even doubt if you start with a waste material that you are allowed to use yeah. it as a jar. Very good point. So that, 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 uh, uh, I think in many cases it's, it's just forbidden. Yeah. So even that... if, it's, if if you prove that it does something, I don't think you get permission to do it. And yeah. so regulation is is not not taken into account. Uh, 
Well, that's this could also be g- generic. There could also be more generic uh, issue uh, if you have an overarching program with, to, to cover some of these uh, things. But, uh, yeah. Uh, well, that anyhow supports an integral program with economics and regulation, and then it's also good not to do that for each of the individual technologies. And and but but uh, there are some regulations that are also uh, hindering more of those uh, potential combinations. So the question here is to the audience, if such a joint technology project program is being set up, would you as an organization like to join? And well, we have only three answer options, which is yes, maybe and no. And well, there may be a lot in between, but this is relevant for us as ISPTLs to know to start uh, elaborating this and to be also uh, to know also who to contact for that. Um, Sasha, to yeah. that, what could be a contribution of the University of Twente in such a program? Oh, yeah, we could do uh, technology assessments. Uh, we could, uh, uh, I, I think, universities by themselves will also uh, start to generate new technologies that can be picked up later on by by industry we can help with particular issues in certain technologies to to tackle yeah i would say the typical role of university we can do quite a lot of things yeah yes and i would in the meantime i'm indicating the uh, one of the last questions like which of the side stream categories should be included and you can probably also answer more so not only uh, um one uh, uh, answer, but just to include, well, I, I see people answering and rejecting again, but um, it's relevant to know uh, here. Yap, could you also answer, could, could there be a role of TNO also in such a program? Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, so that could uh, concern, let's say, the, uh, these more generic uh, issues, inclu- including economics. Uh, and, and for instance, uh, it, can, it should already start with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, drawing good mass and energy balances, uh, which should be the basis for uh, these economic considerations, but, but yeah. also in general to evaluate the process. Uh, we can also uh, have, we have a quite extensive uh, experimental facility, so in that we can uh, support also with uh, analytical facilities. Uh, and actually, at the moment, we're already uh, uh, supporting several startups and, and, and companies with uh, bringing technology to market. Um, uh, and that can also be, let's say, the bottlenecking uh, uh, first plants, uh, demonstration plants, piloting uh, uh, plants. Uh, so it can be in various ways that we can uh, be involved. Yeah. Well, we already saw indeed also the Torwash. Um, uh, spin-off of yeah, it, you know. yeah, yeah. yeah and case loose i see also that quite a lot of people have included a high percentage of inorganic so um good work for you as well yeah yeah both i think uh, also the watery biomass that uh, is produced in uh, wastewater treatment plants for example so the surplus sludge is uh, expensive to uh, to get rid of and uh, it's also a valuable source source of uh, of uh, uh, yeah, components for the chemical industry for energy, uh, but also concentrated streams, brines are difficult to treat. So it's very interesting to have these uh, still new and developing technologies included in the uh, treatment possibilities. Um, and I think uh, from KWR side, it's also interesting to look to these side streams and uh, help for the overall total picture to get uh, uh, yeah, good circular systems with these new technologies. Yeah, thanks a lot. I look at the time at this moment because we are already three minutes over time and I see also in the chat that other partners are also offering their help. And uh, I was just showing the last uh, um, uh, uh, slide and uh, yeah, I see that, well, all of the technology are interested except for the one for TNO, but I have to say that's also because we did not have those dangerous materials in there, but. Personally, I think all of us were impressed about what is possible there, and I'm sure that there will be uh, uh, some interest also for that technology. So I would like to um, 
And just with one final uh, 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 question to the audience um, on just giving just some general remarks. What are the challenges to be solved? And we, of course, heard already a lot. We heard the economics, we heard the regulations, uh, mass and energy balances, what kind of markets. But this is just a wrap up, a kind of, um, yeah, how we call it in Dutch, uh, the rondvraag, or um, uh, what, what still uh, needs to be remarked. Um, so please put your um, comments here. And I would like to thank all the participants today, so all the people that, that provided insight in the complexity of their site streams, which they want to find uh, solutions for. And to all the nine technology suppliers for their really interesting presentations. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, of course, to our panel, Sasha, Bert, Kees, Jaap, it was good to have you here. And of course, a big thanks also to my colleagues, especially to Davy and Amme for assisting in the preparation of this event. And um, yeah, we hope to come back with you. We hope a physical event in February, but anyhow, we will start preparing for such a program as we discussed in the last minutes of this meeting. Thanks a lot. Have a nice evening. And uh, yeah, bye Herman, I see you. Bye bye. <laughs> and uh, and uh, 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 see you next time. Thanks a lot.